And now we have our illustrious Ingrid Bachman, who has uh, synthesized so much of this and is such a fine artist here in Montreal. Turn it over to you and uh, note the, um, the amazing, what I would call, free association that is involved in creativity that uh, we get to follow the train of when these splendid artists are talking. So I'm going to talk a little bit less about previous work. Check out my website, which is hopelessly outdated. It's, uh, it uses Flash, which is apparently so uncool. Um, but at the end of June, I will be in the 21st century uh, in terms of my web. The Canadian literary critic Northrop Fry once said that all poets are licensed liars and that the poet is not heard but overheard. And I'm really interested in how artistic subjectivity can express sort of different kinds of truths, the stories we tell as individuals, as cultures, and that sort of intersection between lies and stories, fact and fiction. In many ways, site specificity is at the root of my practice, and that's actually not an accurate term. My main interest in all my work in being in kind of in dialogue with something else, and that dialogue may be with an architectural space, it may be with a set of ideas or values or belief system, a person, place, or thing. And I work in existing sites, um, sometimes with found or discarded objects, as well as with life forms such as humans, tectonic plates, and uh, hermit crabs. So as an artist primarily working with, before, interactive, kinetic, and site-specific installations, I often work with all levels of technology, from really redundant to relatively state-of-the-art. And I'm really interested in kind of creating a situation or a dynamic where things can happen. And it's really interesting that I'm showing this really ancient work that I did while I was uh, in Alberta, when I was actually part of the resident. I was, I was working at the Banff Center where Catherine did her, um, with Nell Tenoff, did, did organize this residency on the bioapparatus. And it was the first time that virtual reality, and it was like, oh, it was the rhetoric. You know, it was going to change your life. It could do your laundry. You could be anywhere. You could see. You could smell. It didn't promise to do laundry. So I, see, I, I told you I lied at the beginning. So, But what I wanted to do, I wanted to do everything that virtual reality did. So I wanted it to engage the full human sensorium. I wanted it to be interactive, changing. But I wanted to do it in an analog version. And so often what I've done in my work is do analog and digital. And so rather than thinking of them as binaries, just thinking them of as different ways of understanding it. So I turned a gallery into a giant chalkboard. I left giant chalks, bicycles, ladders, heads of authorities, certain things that I hoped would be cues, and then allowed people to kind of work in and around it. And so, in a way, I sort of think I kind of did create that. I also then, at the time, tried to do a, a piece like that on the, net, on the web, and it was called A Nomad Web, Sleeping Beauty Awakes. And this is before we have the, which shows my age, the web as we know it, because at that point there wasn't even a browser like Firefox and Mosaic wasn't even available, which for any of you know, that was one of the first uh, internet browsers. And so a program had to be written to access the internet. And so I tried to create a space a little bit like the chalkboard piece where people could interact, make comments. It was also important for me too that uh, I had training sessions to um, show people how they could get internet accounts. And I think it was one of the first internet projects in Canada. Of course, no images could go up on it because <laughs> it's not possible. You, it was possible, but it would take sort of an, an hour and then it would crash. So it was really this sort of, but also this desire to really kind of create community. Um, in another piece I did that, so my relation to this project um, is also kind of in this way and really looking at it as a situation, looking at the patient stories and also the, the narratives of, of the Pith team and kind of work my way in it. This was a piece I did in Montreal here in called Hôpital, an abandoned hospital. And in many ways, I kind of really turned back to this work because it's, it's a, it looks like nothing, right? Because it was really a completely experiential piece. The whole room was embedded with amber light, amber gel on the windows, amber lights were embedded in the wall. And then every five minutes, a copper waterfall that I would put into the window would weep. So when you came into the room, there was this amber glow, there was this water. 
And it was really about trying to create something that was really an experience that existed within the body at that moment in time, and that some way did not exist if people weren't there. This is a piece that I did with Lorraine Oates, who I think is here, and Anna Rivakovic, in an abandoned um, pool here in Montreal called Ben Saint Michel. And I wanted in that, we wanted in that piece too to really create something that the spectator or the visitor was absolutely integral, but also that was really experiential. And I think in the work, working with the, the video footage from the transplant research team, from the PIT team, this notion of experiential, of having this, these patients having these really profound physical experiences, but also very immaterial. You know, they do want people who've suffered any kind of major shift or trauma do wander about in the world and we don't know it. So it was interesting, Alexa's point about the woman wanting the wheelchair because it said something has happened to me. I've also done some research in a medical textile factory where they were actually making the heart valves that are often used in valve replacement and they were made actually farming because there are, most of them are pork valves, porcine valves, and also they had a mechanical one. But I was at first interested in all the textile technology that was used going into these safe hospital rooms where they were knitting the fabric that would go around the heart valve. They were weaving human aortas because weaving is a very strong kind of structure. And then I became very interested in this notion of life and kind of how we always put the human life at the center. So this piece is called Pelt Bestiary. And I wanted to sort of look at a cyborg that kind of included an animal as well, the human animal. And so there are these, a series of six sort of kinetic and interactive sculptures that have very different characteristics of sort of life forms, I think. For this project, um, it was a really interesting challenge. As someone said, it started seven years ago, and it was really remarkable to be invited by the scientific team. And I think it's such a stretch for hard, I think hard scientists to go into the world of art or outside of their comfort zone that it also really was a challenge for me to think, well, this is really important for me to go outside of my comfort zone. That was really essential. And I thought they, um, the generosity of opening up this research, which has really serious consequences. I think as an artist, I, feel, I felt a certain license. <laughs> Artistic license, in fact, is what it's called. And so to work in a project where there were real experiences, very deep human and emotional experiences. And so it was really, in a way, the time span was odd because we had to get through a great deal of ethical clearance because, in a way, this kind of collaboration is really unprecedented in Canada. That took a lot of time, I think three years. And then we, went, we finally got to see the footage, so we all came down. And because of its, uh, well, its ethical nature, we could only see it in Toronto at uh, Toronto General. And, um, and it was pretty moving. And at that time, I took a lot of notes. And I have to admit, I was really struck also by Enza, uh, Enza DeLuca and Oliver Mouthner, who are also part of the Pith research team, who are right there, who were the interviewers. And the kind of gentleness, the kind of ease with which they could prompt such provocative and interesting comments. Also, of course, there were rather fabulous questions that were really carefully crafted. And I think there was also that idea, too, of how you go to go to a point where you're going to hear things you don't want to hear. There's, there's an element of courage in there that I've, and risk that I, I really um, appreciated. So we've gone back and forth. And I was originally working on this particular sound piece which works with a transducer sensor. Transducer sensors actually work through the bone. So you actually don't, it's not really a speaker. It's a little hard to see that they're holding to their body. It's actually, um, okay, so you're the only one if you're holding it and holding it to a bone that you can hear, in this case, the words of uh, transplant recipients. I'm great. Oops, let's see. Hmm. Okay, let me see if I can get it this time. I'm great. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. Really, really great. Really great. But, but 
I'm great. I'm great. But, um, but they see me as normal. normal. Like a normal, like a normal person. person. I am better than I before. I am better than before. But, but pain is pain. pain. Is pain. I have dreams. I am somewhere or, and, and I, I can't, can't get, get out. out. In my, my dream, dream, I am, I am invisible, invisible to others. To others. Colors the are colors so are so bright. bright. It was, it was not, not a part, part of me at the, at the beginning. beginning. Now it feels like now a part it feels of me. like part of me. I get angry more easily now. I took a compilation. Of more stubborn. I transcribed a lot of the texts of, um, of, of, of the conversations, and I listened, as I wrote them, I, I sort of condensed them into a kind of script. But all the words are actually the words of the transplant patients. I did take out all mentions of heart or transplant because I wanted the sensation to be a bit more evocative, and I also wanted it to be felt in the body. And the reason I'm co-reading it is because I, I sort of, um, I don't have that particular um, tape here, but I wanted to have this, this doubling up inside the body. And so it was very important for me that this whole experience was very physical. Um, because of that too, after I went back this January to re-look at the footage and I spent three and a half intensive days in rather miserable gray January, locked in a cubicle looking at the interviews. And, um, and so, I, you know, it's a lot about, it's very, it's actually traumatic, it's really moving. And so I was also thinking about just how you deal with that, working with that every day. And I've, I think when I worked site specifically, I've always tried to honor or be in conversation with the place, but, or the situation, and this felt even stronger in this piece. And, I felt, as Heather said, in terms of talking about the video interviews, that when I saw the, the interviews, I really wanted to work with gesture because I felt there was so much that was expressed in the gesture. And I happened to know two dancers. Uh, one is my niece and uh, her friend who've been in the Concordia dance program for four years are graduating. So I've gone to every end of term show multiple times. So I really know their work. And so when I thought of working with gestures, I thought, I want to work with dancers. And because I sort of knew these dancers and knew how they worked, I thought that would be a very nice um, way to do it. And so we literally, again, and I thought, well, this is also appropriate because I kind of go out of my own comfort zone, too, because I am not a choreographer. Um, and so I worked with them, and I told them many of the stories, and I also took some of the, what I thought were the major themes. And the theme of the gift is probably the largest theme, one of the largest themes that came out of this research, but the gift in many complicated ways. And so the first one I was thinking of the gift, well, there's of course the gift, the gift of second life, the gift of life, which is also part of the, the rhetoric around donation and transplant, but it's also something that many patient, patients said, like this is the gift of life. This is a second life. They celebrate their birthday often on the date of their transplant, a new birthday. And so I asked the dancers to, to dance weight, to dance joy, to be a healthy heart, to be a dying heart, um, to, in this case, strut. Because one of the things that came out and was recurring is like, I'm great, but, but. And you really saw that in the gestures. Oh, I'm great but, and then these buts. And, and so there's this really, um, there's so many complimentary things that happened during this time in terms of their, their work. And so that was kind of a wonderful experience. And now I have two clips. Um, this also was, of course, a gesture that probably everyone here has done, but it's certainly a gesture that everyone in, in the videos did more than once. I forget how to get my videos up. Sorry. <laughs> I work with technology, yeah. <laughs> and this was a version of the second, the gift, the gift as 
a sort of life, and it's a little hard to see. And, and everything was, I really wanted to work with two dancers because the sense of there's always the donor, the recipient, the healthy heart, the unhealthy heart, the complex emotions people have, being grateful, being sad that someone died, that they got the heart, wanting it. Also, as Margaret pointed out, the immune system, the body needing the heart, the immune system wanting to reject it. So that sense of dualities, the colors and the costumes too are kind of, they're not really costumes. In this thing too, it was really this idea of how now this, this dancer can now dance on her own. So she no longer needs the support of Can you do the other one? This one's almost done. Yeah. You want me to stop it? Yeah. One of the really compelling things we saw too was the image of a healthy heart, which is this beautiful, vibrant red, and then the image of a dead heart, which is a sort of mustardy color. And so, hmm. That's my hermit crab, who I have worked with. <laughs> He's very cooperative. This is a, there's a series of nine segments that are all based on various themes that have come up. Um, and this one's called Grasp, and I think hopefully reflects the kind of push-pull of, well, of many parts of this project. Um, I'll be working with sound designer Doug Moffat, is also here to design the sound. And, um, and I think that's it. I'd again, I'd really, I have to admit this, for me as an artist, this project has been a bit of a dream because it's very rare that scientists approach artists. And also I think to participate in works that are, that are kind of address really pressing questions in our culture, I think are really, that's, it, it adds a certain responsibility, but I, I think it's its own gift, so thank you. <laughs>